Okay, hello. Um, so I have nothing to disclose here, no conflicts. And um, we've seen this, these pumps before, and I basically just show you that these are the currently approved FDA pumps. And uh, these two below are our two work uh, horses, so continuous flow pumps. Our pulsatile pumps are no longer made. And um, you've seen that one before. What I want to go through now are the results of our destination trials. And I know you've seen some of this before. My, my take is going to be slightly different. I'm going to focus on the adverse events that are pump related because that really drives how we take care of our patients uh, as an outpatient. So understanding what the adverse events were in these trials is critical to um, uh, implanting these patients safely. So the rematch trial Dr. Eisen went through, it's the uh, trial looking at the pulsatile XVE pump. And uh, Dr. Lee also showed you the slide early on, which showed that the pulse survival with the pulsatile pump was far superior to the medical arm. And this, this slide is worth showing because in terms of our LVAD trials, you'll see that they are now comparing one pump to another or one pump to registry data. But this, this uh, particular trial looked at patients who uh, were optimal medical management versus pumps. And so it's very important to look at what happened to the medical arm. And as you'll see, at, at one year, the survival was only 25%. So when we're consenting our patients, patients about whether or not they should, should consider LVAD, this is the trial that I always go back to. This is the best that medical management can do, and that's a one-year survival of about 25%. The other thing to uh, understand from that trial, oh, I don't know how to go back. The other thing that I was going to show from that trial is that in terms of patients who went on to have LVADs, the survival of two years was only 30%. So if you're interested in destination therapy, that may not seem like a, a good trade-off. You've seen this slide before, and this is the, the um, adverse events in the post-rematch trial, so after uh, marketing. And the leading cause of death uh, in patients with LVAD was sepsis, stroke, multi-organ failure, and RV failure. So we've heard a lot about RV failure, and the way to mitigate RV failure is to pick your patients appropriately in the pre-op period. But I want you to focus on and just remember this theme of sepsis, multi-organ failure, and stroke when you look at uh, LVAD trials. So in terms of our, the next phase, um, that was uh, a continuous flow pumps, and you've seen the data from the HeartMate 2 trial. And as Dr. Eisen alluded to earlier in his talk, when that, tri when that uh, study was started, a lot, we had a lot of questions about what the physiology of continuous flow means. Is, is it going to be sufficient enough to unload a heart? Um, will right heart function suffer with continuous flow? Uh, the other interesting caveat is patients who go to continuous flow pumps require Coumadin. That was not the case with the pulsatile pumps. So everyone had a question as to whether or not you'd have more major bleeding if you shift focus from pulsatile pumps to continuous flow pumps. And finally, after years of uh, continuous flow, what would end organ function be like? So those were very important questions uh, when this trial started in terms of uh, looking at the heart made too as a, a, for destination therapy. So we saw um, from previous slides Oops, something's out of order here. Okay, so here's the, uh, the uh, survival curves, and you can see that the continuous flow pumps were superior to pulsatile pumps, which is what led to um, them sunsetting the production of the uh, pulsatile pump. The next trial that you've heard about earlier today is the endurance trial, and this was the centrifugal pump, which is also continuous flow. Um, and in this particular trial, they compared head-to-head -head the hardware um, device to the HeartMate 2 device. Okay. And the endpoint in this trial is a little bit different than survival. So the primary endpoint was survival free as if of, uh, from disabling stroke or from pump replacement. So remember, we've heard from previous um, speakers that there's a concern about uh, pump thrombosis with the HeartMate 2. So in this trial, they looked at uh, survival free of disabling stroke uh, or pump thrombosis. And it was a non-inferior trial, uh, non-inferiority uh, endpoint, and you can see that the two pumps were essentially equivalent. But what about the adverse events? So we've heard that the hardware may have more strokes, the heart may too has more thrombosis. So in this particular trial, they looked at all of these endpoints, and I'll focus on the key ones, which are stroke, so in this trial, they showed that the hardware device actually had more strokes compared to the uh, HeartMate 2, but in terms of pump replacement, the hardware turned out to be a more durable pump. So that's the trade-off. The other thing that you heard earlier is that there was more right heart failure with the hardware device, but the key question was need for RVAD, and there was no difference between the two. So you could expect a little bit more RV um, failure in the post-op period, which could be managed medically. The use of RVADs was similar in the two groups. <clears throat> 
So what were the lessons learned from, uh, oh, I see. the lessons learned from the uh, DT trials? First, that um, for patients with stage D heart failure, uh, LVAD therapy does prolong survival. We find now that continuous flow pumps are superior to uh, pulsatile flow pumps, but we find that there are a lot of serious adverse events that still are device-related that occur with all of these trials, and that's gonna be stroke, multi-system organ failure, and uh, infection. And so what we focus on in the outpatient setting is really uh, paying attention to uh, factors that can actually mitigate those uh, things from happening. So what about the real world data? So you guys have heard about the Intermax registry, and it's really important to go back to that in terms of learning pr best practices. So I happened to look on the website before I came this week, and at this point, they're up to 20, to date on 21,000 patients or 21,000 implants. So it's really a wealth of knowledge um, with how, to, uh, or how our patients are doing uh, post-LVAD implantation. So the data I'm gonna talk about from Intermax is from their seventh annual report, which had about 12,000 continuous flow pumps. And you've seen this slide before, but I just show that in terms of centrifugal pumps, um, they seem pretty much equivalent uh, in the real world. And in terms of one year survival, it's 80%, which is actually better than what they saw in trial data. And again, as you've heard before, if you end up with RV dysfunction and require a BIVAD, your survival is a lot less than uh, those who uh, go with LVAD alone. The other thing that we, uh, which you'll find in, in the newer trials is that they look at uh, the requirement for pump replacement because that happened a lot with the XVE or the pulsatile pumps. And you can see that after each operation uh, for a redo pump, your survival goes dramatically down. So in our practice, for our patients who are destination, a lot of them several years into it are now on their second pump. We even have a gentleman who's on his third pump and he's actually not doing well. So pump durability in terms of uh, destination therapy is key. And if you follow your patients long enough, you, you're gonna see um, pump failure, or sorry, mechanical failure. The good news about it is if you haven't tied off the aortic valve, as Dr. Fisher uh, mentioned, you have time to get the patient in, get them optimized and exchange the pump. So in terms of adverse events, this is from uh, the Intermax data set. So again, I sound like a broken record, but the key issue uh, is bleeding. And in this particular slide, they're showing you results from the early era of continuous flow, so 2008 to 2011, to a more contemporary cohort. So bleeding remains the most common adverse event, but it's gone down uh, over this time period. Cardiac arrhythmias are also important, especially in the post-op period, but they're actually easily manageable. So the good news with these patients, if they have uh, incessant in VT or even VF, you can support them through it uh, if the LVAD is in place. The incidence of hypertension has actually decreased in the continuous flow era, so patients with pulsatile pumps always had very high blood pressures. Uh, the number of infections also remains quite high, but it's actually lower now, and we think it has to do with better driveline care. But here's the bad news. It looks like the incidence of stroke has actually increased when you look at the uh, two eras, so that's gonna be something very important to follow. Uh, part of it is, is that in the earlier era, my thought is, in the earlier era, we were a little less aggressive on INRs um, with the HeartMate 2s just because we were so concerned about bleeding. But as you've heard um, from previous speakers, that's led to more pump thrombosis, so we've sort of shifted back. And not sure if that has anything to do with the higher stroke rate between the two eras, but that's been seen in the Intermax data. So the primary cause of death in LVAD patients, neurologic event, multi-system organ failure, which really is related to progressive heart failure symptoms that you can't treat. Um, withdrawal of support, so that goes back to our earlier discussion. Um, when you're training the patients before the LVAD goes in place, that you wanna have a palliative care consult and discuss end of life issues because you find yourself at the end with family saying or suggesting that uh, you turn the pump off. Uh, the other thing is uh, major infection, which always uh, remains a hazard. Device malfunction is pretty low at 3.5%, because a lot of times you have time to evaluate the patient, stabilize them, and do the pump exchange. So in terms of adverse events, you saw some of this with uh, Dr. Lee's slide. And so this is also from Intermax, and it's showing the time to the first uh, major uh, adverse event. And as she stated, a lot of this happens up front in the three to six month period. If you break down okay, uh, by actual events, that previous slide was a composite, this is really driven by rehospitalization. So in the first uh, six month period, you can fully expect your patients to be readmitted to the hospital. 
So a lot of, t and this is first hospitalization, so usually if there's one hospitalization, there's, there's several other. So a lot of people will sell um, LVAD therapy as though you're not gonna end up, you're gonna be hospitalized less frequently, and that is true. But in the first uh, six month period, you have to sort of tell patients, um, this is what's gonna happen. A lot of times it has to do with you're nervous, they're nervous, and you really wanna um, evaluate the patient in the hospital to make sure everything is uh, okay. In terms of stroke, that um, is a concert hazard throughout the life of the patient uh, remaining on the pump. As I showed you earlier, stroke is one of the leading causes of deaths with patients who have an LVAD in. In terms of pump-related infection, that's also a constant threat, and generally that starts at the drive line, and if it's not addressed uh, early, migrates through the tunnel, it can end up in the pump pocket. So watching uh, your drive line is very key in terms of what you do on the outpatient side. So lessons we learned from the real world is that uh, continuous flow pumps continue to dominate the field. Survival for patients is actually better than what they saw in clinical trials. The rate of bleeding and pump-related infections at the time of implant has actually decreased over, um, over time. However, the rate of neurologic events has not decreased over this period of time. And again, death is neurologic, multi-system organ failure, infection, and withdrawal of support. So understanding all of these adverse events related to the pump, that actually dictates how we uh, treat these patients as an outpatient. And for the cardiologist here, um, the other thing you have to caution your patients about is once the LVAD goes in, doesn't mean you're not gonna have heart failure symptoms. So all of the stuff about salt rest, uh, rest, um, restriction and afterload reduction and all the things that they followed as heart failure patients a lot of times still pertains. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of our patients have biventricular failure, so you still have an RV in play, and so that requires uh, you know, meticulous optimization of your medical therapy once the pump goes in. So symptom management uh, combined with minimizing device-related comp uh, complications is really what you're focusing on as an outpatient. So after low reduction in pump speed are how we optimize heart failure symptoms. So as Dr. Fisher alluded to you earlier, uh, these pumps are very sensitive to afterload, so you're still gonna pull out your ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. A lot of these patients still have uh, arrhythmias, so beta blockers are critical. And what I usually do in practice is after I've optimized after low reduction, have their volume under somewhat control, if they're still symptomatic from a heart failure point of view, then I go to pump speed, and I start titrating pump speed to keep them um, out of failure or to uh, improve their exercise tolerance. And so um, I think Dr. Eisen showed a portion of the slide immediately, is that once the, the pump goes in, your heart um, is decompressed almost immediately, and so in this slide they show basically the echo parameters after the pump goes in, so you're decompressed and the injection fraction increases with, uh, with that afterload reduction. This study, they also looked at hemodynamics uh, early on at one month and again at six months, and as you might expect, when the LVAG goes in, you're able to decrease intracardiac pressures, so their uh, wedge pressure went from the 20s to 12, cardiac output uh, almost doubled. So once you, you put the pump in, you have to decide, okay, what speed am I gonna run the patient at? And generally, when they're in the hospital, you have echoes at your disposal, which is what Dr. Fisher was talking about earlier. And one of the things we do early on, you'll have perhaps a swan in place. So you can optimize cardiac output using that, but you always have to uh, adjust your speeds with echo guidance, because you, what you wanna do is make sure you don't unload the heart to such an extent that your volumes are small and you're more susceptible to having uh, suction events. So anytime you make uh, pump changes, you really need to do it under echo guidance at the time acutely, and then what we do is repeat it again a week later, just because your immediate effect may be different than what you see um, once patients are running at that lower speed for a period of time. So this slide is nice because it just shows um, what happens with hemodynamics as you change the speed as you change the RPMs of the pump. And um, as you would expect, your filling pressures decrease and your cardiac output increases as you uh, change the uh, speeds of the pump. But as I think it was Dr. Eisen that said earlier, you don't want to run it at, you know, uh, you don't want to run it at higher RPMs than you actually need because of uh, chewing up von Willebrand's factor is one thing. The other thing is that if for some reason your patient becomes dehydrated and you're ramping them up at a very high speed on small volumes, you're more likely to cause um, suction, which can lead to arrhythmias, and actually um, people become very profoundly orthostatic and dizzy and lightheaded. So you don't need to run them at very high speeds, and it's really, you know, unfortunately just enough is what you're looking for, which is not, not a formula that you can follow. <laughs> 
So the other thing is minimizing device-related complications. So this is the thing that scares us the most. We feel like we can handle the heart failure symptoms. It's like you do now in practice. But it's the device-related complications that we have to pay a lot of attention to. And as I talked about earlier with the patients who are discharged home, they're now in charge of INR management in terms of uh, doing the measurements at home, and they're in charge of driveline care. So those are the things that are actually patient-centered, so your patients have to be well-trained on what to do in these instances. So in terms of blood pressure, so um, the speakers talked earlier about the hardware device where they found um, more strokes. And so what they did was they, they remanufactured the pump, but they also came back with stricter guidelines about how to control blood pressures uh, for patients with the hardware device. And what they found is that the incidence of ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic strokes are decreased in patients who, every time they come to the outpatient setting, had a, a mean or a map uh, of less than 90 millimeters of mercury, which you see here in the light blue. So blood pressure control is meticulous for controlling both, um, first of all, afterload is for high, uh, heart failure symptoms, but also preventing the dreaded complication of a stroke. So that sounds easy, just measuring the blood pressure, but it's actually very difficult. And, um, this study shows the correlation between the systolic blood pressure and the Doppler blood pressure. And so in our center, we um, just always use the Doppler blood pressure. You'll find sometimes when patients are admitted to the hospital, they'll try to use the automated cuff, and I would caution you against that. Just use Dopplers all the time in your patients to uh, titrate medications. The other thing we found is that um, you have to check the blood pressure uh, both standing and sitting because um, as Dr. Fisher was telling you, you, you push the medicines until they become symptomatic, but you wanna know if they're symptomatic when standing. And a lot of times you'll find that patients are wildly orthostatic that you didn't realize, and if you push the blood pressure medications too far, you'll have syncope and falls, which unfortunately we've had, where people have to go to the emergency room for stitches. So the way to get around that is to check their blood pressure when they're standing up so that you're clear what, the, uh, what their blood pressure is, oh, what will happen with medications. So in terms of INRs, um, as you've heard before, how we anticoagulate patients has gone really back and forth. We were really excited with the HeartMate 2 um, that you could actually run them with a lower INR. And that was, um, we were doing that because we were very worried about GI bleeds, but later on that um, showed up with more pump thrombosis. So this is from our guidelines. We're back to running INRs between two and three. The case where we had a patient that had a, um, with the heart made two, a late pump thrombosis was a patient who was in AFib. So we're also very meticulous and careful about pe uh, keeping people in AFib with the um, INRs of definitely greater than two. So you wanna watch those guys uh, very closely. And now actually with the home INR machine, it's made management very easy. So they just check their, their INRs at home once a week and you have their values right then and there. In terms of driveline care, we already talked about it, but this, this gizmo, which is an anchor for the driveline, is very important uh, to keep it stabilized because once you get a, a, a skin tear here, you set yourself up for developing a cellulitis. The other thing is, is that you wanna visualize this because you'd be surprised how many um, times this coating actually starts to break down. And so a lot of your patients after a year or so require tape. You just put what we call a rescue tape, and we actually um, give them uh, rescue tape to take home just to, to keep the insulation intact. So my conclusions are when you're, uh, talk, when you're managing your patients as an outpatient, uh, they've, they've survived surgery, the RV failure has been taken care of, and now they're with you in the clinic, you still have to caution them that hospital readmissions are common, especially in the first year, and that could be related to heart failure symptoms or, or GI bleeding. The most common device-related adverse effects remain bleeding, infection, and arrhythmia. The leading cause of death for patients with LVADs is stroke, multi-system organ failure, and withdrawal of support, as well as infection. And so again, it's easier to talk to patients before the pump goes in, so that when this inevitably occurs, um, everybody is maybe on the same page about where to go and what to do next. And finally, it's a multidisciplinary uh, care team approach to manage the symptoms. So heart failure symptoms remain common still. Blood pressure, we talked about how that's related to neurologic events. INR and driveline care. And uh, I'll stop there. So. Mm -hmm.